Bruchem Aboim. Welcome everyone to our home. Um, again, this week will be a little bit different. We'll, at the end of the uh, lecture, I will start a new series on music against songs that I had written, but we'll get to that in a minute. But this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine the concept of music and how it connects with Orthodox Judaism. Singing is a part and parcel of Judaism. You know, this whole world is a symphony that sings praises to its creator. The Torah is the melody, and our observance of its commandments serve as a sort of harmony to enhance our song of praise to our Father, our King, who is in heaven. It, it's not a coincidence that the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word shira, song, and the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word tefillah, prayer, are both the same, 515. Our sages tell us that all the angels in heaven combined sing Shira to God Almighty, a total of 550 prayers daily. Now the Pnei Yeshua states that the word Vo'etchanan, that introduces the portion of Vo'etchanan, means that I prayed. Rashi commenting on the word states that this is an expression of prayer, an allusion to the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, offered 550 prayers to God Almighty in the hope that God would allow him to enter the land of Israel. The gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word is 515. Many of our prayers are connected with song. Every day of the year, 365 days of the year, we recite the Shirat Hayom, the song of the sea, the Az Yashur, the song that the Jewish nation sang after they exited from the Red Sea. They exited onto the dry land, whereas the Egyptian army that was pursuing them were all drowned in the waters of the sea. That being the case, once they realized the great miracle that God Almighty had performed for them, they spontaneously broke out in a song of gratitude. We read in the fourth book of the Torah, Numbers, by Midbar, in the portion of Chukat, that the nation also sang a song in conjunction with the well of Miriam, what is strange about this song is that this was the same well that accompanied the children of Israel throughout their 40 years in the desert. This well provided an abundance of water for them in a miraculous fashion. The obvious question that we might ask is, why is it that they waited until the end of their 40-year journey to sing its praises? In addition, with the exception of the splitting of the sea, the well is the only miracle that we find praised in this manner. Why? Why was there no similar praise for the man, the heavenly food that fell daily from heaven, or even the giving of the Torah itself? So just prior to the children of Israel singing their song of the well, the Torah tells us that the nation, that, that the nation had just been attacked by the army of the Amorites. The Amorites had been hiding in caves in a mountain pass that was situated between the two mountains. They did so with the intention of ambushing the unsuspecting Jewish nation as they passed through the valley below. Before the Amorites could mount their ambush, the two mountains that, were, that they were occupying closed together, crushing the waiting Amorites who were trapped in the caves. While this basically was an open miracle, it was not in and of itself sufficient enough to necessitate a song of praise. But when the well of Miriam performed the extraordinary miracle of not only transporting the remains of their vanquished enemies, but also by changing its nature and flowing backwards in the process, this, this was viewed as an extra special display of God's almighty power. This fact aroused within them an extra special response from the children of Israel. And this was done through song. You know, it's interesting that Moshe's name is not mentioned in connection with this miracle of the water. The Tantkuma states that since Moshe was punished because of water, it is not customary for a man to praise his executioner. At the same time, Moshe had altogether ten different names. However, the name the Torah calls him by is the exact name that Basia, Paro's daughter, who took him out of the Nile, called him. The name was Prophetic since its translation means to draw out from the water, future tense. 
in allusion to the fact that Moshe and the Jewish nation would cross the sea. We also read that what Moshe, do, what Moshe does on the last day of his life, as it states in the fifth book of the Torah, in the portion of Ha'azinu, the song. The portion opens with the words that Vayovo Moshe v'yadaber es called divrei hashir azos b'ozne ha'om. Moshe came and he spoke all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Yoshua ben Nun. Now the last memory that the Moshe left with the, with the people with was not a sermon. He sang them a song rather than preached to them. So with his last words still singing in their ears, they watched as he ascended onto Mount Nevo on his final mission, which was to return his holy soul to his maker. I read this in an article of Chabad.org that said words are the building blocks of language, like a vehicle. They shuttle ideas between minds and hearts. Music, on the other hand, is both the soul of the language and the language of the, lang a language of the soul. It has the ability to cross vast gulfs of ideology, culture, nationality, and personality. We witnessed that music and song became an integral part of the temple service. It was one of the primary functions designated to the Levium. They would sing special melodies based on the psalms composed by Governor Melech, King David. Their songs would be accompanied with musical instruments, and many of which were designed by King David himself. The orchestra and the choir of Levium would accompany the Kohanim, the priest, in song as they would perform their sacred duty. Governor Melech writes in Psalm 12, verse 1, To him who grants victory on the instrument with eight strings, a psalm of David. Rav Shimshul of Hirsch states that the harp that was played in the temple had seven strings. Now the number seven is an allusion to this natural world, whereas the number eight is an allusion to that which is above this world. Our sages tell us that the eight-stringed harp symbolizes redemption, since it will be through the Messiah that the world will experience our final redemption. We read many times in Psalms where Dominamel, King David, sings out to God in song. He does so, even in times of deep pain and distress, even after the death of his newborn son. We witness a similar scenario with Aaron, Aaron the priest, after the death of his two illustrious sons, Nagav and Avihu. The Torah describes in the third book of the Torah in the portion of Shemini 9.4, Aaron's reaction to the death of his two sons as, by Yidom Aaron, and Aaron was silent. He was inanimate. So both Dovin and Melech and Aaron accepted God's decision without question or complaint. However, where Aaron was silent, David's reaction was just the opposite. What does David write in Psalm 30.13? Therefore shall I sing out your glory and not be silent. And then there's the ultimate song sung to God, that which was composed by Shlomo Hamela, King Solomon. It's called Shir HaShirim, the Song of Songs. An expression of emotion described in words which, like music, touches deep within one's heart. The Talmudic sage has also contributed to our heritage. According to the Talmud in Shabbat, Rav Hanina would wrap himself in his cloak and say words that we still chant today on Friday night in our service. Come, let us go out and greet the Shabbat Queen. Rav Yanai would put on his robe and bow and say, Boi Chala, Boi Kala. Enter, O Bride, enter, O Bride. First the Kabbalist and then the Hasidic movement were predicated on exuberance and joy. In, early, the, in fact, the early Hasidim were originally referred to as defrelichers, a term in Yiddish which means the holy ones. Sorry, the happy ones. Frelich is happy. Their outward display of love towards God and towards their fellow Jews were filled with song. Some of their songs had words and others nigunim, which were just just melodies, no words at all. Tunes without words, tunes without boundaries. Tunes that allowed one's mind, body, and soul 
to be elevated to the greatest of heights. You know, there's a story told of the Magister Rebbe, whose soul was totally enveloped in song. It is said that in his later years he was in need of an operation. However, the doctors were concerned that they were to put him under an anesthetic, that he may not survive the operation. They were really in a dilemma as to what to do. Uh, he overheard their conversation and he said to them that there was really no need for any concern. He would begin to sing a niggin, and when he reached a state of ecstasy, he would motion to them that he was ready, and then they could begin the operation without any anesthetic. And so it was. He sang throughout the procedure without any pain or discomfort. I think that the Hasidic Fabringen may well be the granddaddy of group therapy. A Fabringen is a gathering where men sit around and they sing songs that touch their hearts and open their minds. They unite together as brothers. They laugh, they drink, they eat, they tell stories, but most of all, they sing songs that can lift their souls up to their Father in Heaven. They tell a story about the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement. He was visiting a city where many of those who resided there were against the Hasidim and their approach to Judaism. He was asked to speak. It happened that many people had come with tough questions and they wanted him to answer. He stepped up to the podium and he began. He said, I know that many of you have questions that you would like to ask of me, but before we begin, I would like to sing you a niggin. He began to sing. He sang for a period of time. And when he ended his song, there was not one question left to be addressed from any of those in attendance. All the questions had been answered. Music, the language of the soul. The Hebrew word for chokmah, which we translate as wisdom, I think is incorrect. Wisdom is something that you have acquired through time and effort. The word is really a composite of two Hebrew words, koach ma, which may loosely be translated as a seminal flash, an idea, an idea that just pops into your mind. Where does an idea originate from and how do you access it? It's not like you can go to the store and find the aisle that sells ideas, innovations, inventions, or music. I believe that all of these thoughts are a gift from a benevolent Father in Heaven, some of us are chosen to be able to tune into these messages, while others are not. I think that we are all gifted, special in some way. We just have to find it and then connect to it. You know, the process may become something like a personal star search. But if we don't look, well, then we won't find it. There are many people that possess latent talents that have never been developed. I've been blessed with a talent to play guitar and sing a gift that I thank God for daily. It has helped me through many tough times in my life. I've also been blessed with an ability to compose music. Now, if you ask me, how does one compose a song? I really have no answer. I believe that it's just a gift from God Almighty above. When I first became a Baal Tshuva, I, I didn't really know any songs that I could, could sing with my family at our Shabbat table. And so I decided to compose some of my own songs. God blessed me with the inspiration and I was able to compose several songs. The blessing continues and I've done so ever since. Really no rhyme or reason somehow. They just come to me, an inspiration. For that gift, I'm very grateful to my dear Father in heaven. I've also been blessed in that I've been able to innovate novel thoughts in my Torah learning what I refer to as base Mordechai. I always say that no matter how, how innovative a Torah thought may be, if you study long enough, well, you will usually find that someone else has already proposed your idea. It's not novel. However, a song, well, that I believe is totally different. It is unique. When one composes a song, it is a personal gift from a loving Father in Heaven, a gift to you and to no one else. I think that fact makes a song so very special, precious. You know, I put together this little poem I'd like to end with. Songs can make us happy. Songs can make us sad. Songs can make us laugh. Songs can make us mad. Though a song has no body, it does have a soul. 
It touches all equally, whether we are young or whether we are old. So let us all sing together, you know the words, and let us lift our voices up to heaven so that they can soar like the wings of a bird. In the hope that we can hasten in the time when we'll all say, Hashem Echad to Shmo Echad, that he is one and that his name be one. So let us pray. With that, let's bring in the coming of Shia Tzukainu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. Um, let me wish you all again a great week of safety, of happiness, and joy, all that is good, and a Shabbat Shalom. Again, what we're going to do now is we're going to start a new series on music. And um, we're going to take a slight pause, and then we will begin. Again, thank you for attending.